put this durable goods number in context of what we're seeing in terms of we're trying to gauge how much of a slowdown in the industrial economy in the U.S. Uh, is, uh, is being felt uh, against a pretty strong consumer. What do you expect? Yeah, well, you, you put your finger on it. The areas of the economy that are struggling are the manufacturing sector, in particular capital goods. And actually, these numbers weren't that good because although <clears throat> you had a slight increase in the orders numbers, they were revised down for June. And so we don't see at the moment any traction uh, in capital spending, despite the fact that we had the tax cuts here in Hofka, we expected a much bigger capital spending response. And it has to come down to trade uncertainty to me as the factor that's holding back uh, capital spending. And that's not only important for the balance of the economy. It, it's important for getting productivity growth higher, which is essential given the demographics of the U.S. slowing uh, labor force growth. Uh, and we're, we're just not seeing what we, the vitality that we really uh, would have hoped to have seen in the, from the uh, manufacturing economy. Mark, uh, given that, uh, what do you expect the Fed to do in September, and will it be effective <clears throat> in trying to support this expansion and, and revive certain parts of the economy? Well, we expect them to cut a quarter point in, at the September meeting, and and, and I think the language will, will remain pretty much as it is, that they're, that they're prepared to do more um, given the uncertain circumstances that are ahead of them. I, I don't know that we're going to get a resolution in, in trade before September. Uh, who knows? I mean, it, it swings a lot from day to day. But we do know that we've got Brexit uh, at the end of October, which uh, is, is looking like it's going to be a hard Brexit or a no-deal type Brexit. Um, but uh, that, that unleashes a whole lot of uncertainty. The Fed meets October 29th and October 30th. Do they want to cut ahead of that, or do they want to wait and see how things unfold? I don't know. But I, but I, I really think that if uh, Powell's notion is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, is, uh, is, is, <laughs> then, uh, then there's probably more than 50 basis points in cuts in an ounce of prevention. Mohammed, you were, you were talking earlier, just citing uh, the weak uh, German manufacturing number overnight, emerging markets currencies uh, under a lot of pressure. Uh, is this now, do we da have downside momentum in, in global growth? Because there has been some indications that some of the economic surprise indexes have curled higher. In other words, that maybe we were uh, bottoming out in terms of global activity, trade acts are, you know, uh, escalation notwithstanding. No, I think undoubtedly we, the momentum is still to slow, to slow further. And at some point, we're going to be, all to be talking about tipping points and stall speed, especially in Europe. Um, John, but I'm, I'm, now that we have John on set, keen to ask you a question. We're seeing two major decoupling, business versus the consumer, right. and then manufacturing, or how, what I like to put, tradable versus non-tradable. So take us through the next 12 months. How long can that decoupling go on? How long can the U.S. economy rely on the consumer and on the non-tradable sector to, offset, to more than compensate what's happening to business and what's happening to manufacturing? Well, as you know, <laughs> forecasting timelines is hard, but let's talk about what we can look at. To me, the crucial indicator is the share of profits in the domestic economy. And after we got the second quarter GDP data, we had revisions that showed that profit margins hadn't stabilized but have continued to be squeezed. And so what is the glue that holds this economy together is the job creation. The job creation has decoupled from capital spending. But if that job creation machine really begins to stumble, and it, interestingly, it hasn't slowed as much this year as we would have thought because we had these large revisions that are going to come in in March of next year, <clears throat> for March of this year, that revises down job creation last year to around 160, 170,000 jobs a month. So the jobs machine has kept going. So th that's the, the key thing for me is if profit margins can stabilize, then we can limp through. If profit margins continue to contract, then at some point that undermines employment growth, that undermines income growth, uh, and that undermines consumer spending. <clears throat> and there's very little the Fed can do. The, the idea the Fed can cut interest rates, and, and, and to Powell's own admission at the press conference, he said, well, my anecdotal comments, no one tells me the cost of funding is holding back capital spending. So monetary policy would be better, in my opinion, saving its bullets and, and, and being a bystander and responding as that timeline unfolds, if finally the manufacturing sector and capital spending drags the consumer down. So Mark said 25 basis points in September. I fundamentally agree with you as to what should happen. Yeah, but they will cut 25 basis points. And what about, what's the probability, both to you and to Mark, of a 50 basis points cut? I, I, I don't think they can do 50 or will do 50 because 
they do have to keep one eye on the inflation story. Uh, and one of the things we talked about, and the Fed started talking about it again, is, is, is there trimmed means and the median inflation numbers have been running around 2%. And over the last three months, their own favorite inflation measure, core PC price, has been running at 2%. So I, I think they, they just keep, keep cutting. Remember, right now, they're still signaling it's a mid-course correction. It's a recalibration of policy. 50 basis points is no longer recalibration. I think it would have a, a negative impact on risk assets because then it would be, uh, oh, the, the Fed's really now fighting recession that th they must presume is coming. Mark, uh, do you think there is a possibility of 50 basis points? And I guess uh, just a broader question. Do bond yields make sense right here, given the setup that we've all described in terms of 150 for the 10-year note, about the same uh, for the two-year, and the market implicitly demanding more from the Fed? Yeah, I, I don't think 50 is, is on the table. I think that the Fed president's made that clear, that, that, that a lot of them are not on board for another cut. And I, I, I kind of think that's a, a little bit of talk, a little bit of overreaction. It's also the role that, that Fed presidents have traditionally played. But I think if they went 50, I think people would, would feel that, that, uh, there was, that the Fed sensed there was more risk in the economy and that they would have less to, less basis, fewer basis points to deal with any contingency down the road. In terms of bond yields at their current levels, I, I, it, uh, it, it really flies in the face with the economic data, which suggests that the economy is continuing to grow at around a 2 percent annual rate. Uh, we're, we're expecting 2.3 percent growth this year. I think that's a, a very reasonable forecast. We're, we're, we're almost through the third quarter. It looks like we're going to have 2.2 or 2.1 percent growth somewhere in that, in that ballpark. Um, bond yields below 2 percent don't make sense in an economy growing 2 percent. All right. See, uh, they certainly have, uh, have gotten stretched to the downside. We'll see if, uh, if that changes anytime soon. Mark, John, thank you very much.